Greetings, nerds. This is Will Polk, producer and co-host of the Cena Nerd Podcast with Sarah Belmont. Thank you so much for joining. Cena Nerd presents the interviews, and today we have a very special guest, Rem Scabell, who is an independent filmmaker, and he's here to talk about his film, Beverly Hills Exorcist, and some other things that uh, may come up during our conversation. Welcome to the podcast, Rem. Hi, Will. Thank you so much for having me. This is a, a privilege. Oh, well, the privilege is ours. Thank you so much for reaching out to us and, uh, you know, and, and sharing a, a screener uh, of your uh, upcoming project that's going to be dropping. It's going to be dropping soon, correct? We're actually having our world theatrical premiere at GeekFest, um, at GeekFest's first standalone theatrical event. Normally, they travel all the biggest Comic Cons in the country. But this time they're doing a standalone theatrical event, and um, we are in the last program, the really competitive horror block, and it's um, really an appropriate venue for our, for our film. So I'm really excited about it. Yeah, excited excited to see it. And uh, where is Geekfix going to uh, the standalone event's going to be at? It's going to be at um, the Leam. I don't know how to pronounce it. The Leamly. Uh, okay. North Hollywood Seven in um, North Hollywood, and um, and it's a we're gonna have a really really good presentation there. We're gonna project from a really beautiful uh, file that I had authored by the archetype in Burbank, who specializes in theatrical cinema packages, mm. and it has a great sound mix. And so I'm really excited people can see it like that. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, yeah, be sure to check that out. We'll make sure to drop a link to the Film Fest in in the show notes for our interview today, so you can get tickets to it if you're if you're there local or if you want to fly to you know, everyone if you're happy to be visiting uh, Hollywood and, and Los Angeles, you can um, that area. You can you can go to the to the Film Fest. Um, before we get really into the film, I just want to little bit, learn a little bit more about you. Uh, what got you into filmmaking? Uh, and, and also, what's your favorite geek project? We, we, we of course, right now uh, on the podcast, we're currently discussing uh, Fallout and uh, X-Men 97 as some of the projects. But uh, what's your favorite uh, geek IP and, and, and what you're watching these days? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know what? If it, if you're going to ask me what my favorite geek properties are, I'll have to say I, I have to give it to Hideo Kojima and the Metal Gear Solid series. Okay. Um, those were like the first experiences I had where like, I was blown away by a video game. Mm-hmm. And so uh, um, what I'm watching these days, um, I just finished Fallout on Amazon in like one sitting. And... Um, <laughs> And I, uh, I'm really happy that now they're doing, uh, video games are getting such a great representation with narrative film and television. So, um, and of course, I love all the classic geek stuff, you know, like Back to the Future, um, yeah. Ghostbusters, um, you know, Lord of the Rings. I mean, you name it. it um, I, I, what got me into film was basically... Um, I just like creating worlds, and mm-hmm. and I think that when you do something that's fantasy, you can actually be more honest than you can when you're doing something very grounded, because you're in a very symbolic world. So you can explore themes and topics that maybe, in a way that it's, you can set aside the things that um, people get bogged down in and really focus on these emotional connections with topics that are are not often talked about. So, mm-hmm. to me, you're really much more free when you're doing a fantasy story. Great, great. Yeah. So uh, to that point, so you mentioned um, the fantasy realm, and as and I guess like as we talked about sci-fi and, and those types of types of things. Uh, when when did you start your journey into filmmaking? I mean, so what what was the what was, what was Ram's very first project uh, before he, he, you got into to, to this one? Oh my gosh, my first project, I was a little kid and I was uh, doing stop motion animation with oh. my toys and, and Play-Doh and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, you know, like everybody that gets the skills and the knowledge to do filmmaking, I got into advertising and sure. I started working on uh, and I also started editing a lot of 
features that would go direct to video and uh, really learned what industrial filmmaking was. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got to an, a point where I'm like, well, I don't really like working on other people's movies uh, it, as much as I like working on my own. So I decided if I'm going to do films, I'm just going to do my own now. And so this is where my film, uh, Beverly Hills Exorcist, kind of popped out. And um, it's something I'm really uh, proud of because it kind of incorporates a lot of what I learned working for uh, other people as an editor and also what I've learned from advertising and just doing really large projects mm -hmm. and putting it into something that um, I think is really unique but I still think connects with people in a very uh, personal way. Um, it's my first like narrative, like really trying to make something highly impactful. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I feel good about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know one of the things uh, I was really wanted to, to to learn more about. So you, you talked about these experiences in the past, and, and as far as being in industrial filmmaking and uh, straight to video work, what are some of the behind the scenes? And, I, and we will get. I do you know do want to talk to you about uh, Beverly Hills Exorcist, but you know I, I know a lot of things that uh, some of our listeners and, and and sometimes in our engagement on social we really get into the the, the nuts and bolts of, of filmmaking and, and production um it, it just expand on some of the things you've learned that you learned in those prior uh, projects and, and experiences as far as filmmaking budgeting because i mean because one of the things uh just to touch on uh, beverly hills that's just this a little bit. I know there's a lot of VFX in, in this project, and, uh, and 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 being that you're an independent filmmaker, you know you, you don't have a big studio backing you. So, what are you know what 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 are some of the things that go into uh, into making a film or, or a TV show, and, and especially one where you're an independent filmmaker, where you're you're trying to finance this, get financing for a project like this. That's a great question. That's a, there's such a scope to that question. Um, one thing I learned working as an editor on other people's films is that um, this is kind of a nuts and bolts thing, but always let the actor finish the scene. It doesn't matter how wrong they get it. Don't interrupt them. Just let them finish the scene because when you're editing, you need all of those scenes. You need them finishing it every time. If you have a scene that was kind of good, but then the director stopped it because the cup was in the wrong place, that is just goes in the trash. You, and, but so actually, you really need those scenes. So and also I'll always get an actor walking in to the scene. Always just get that shot. Get a shot of them opening the door and walking in. You never know when you're going to need it. It might save your life. Um, uh, and uh, as far as like budgeting and um, resources go, I mean, that's always a challenge mm -hmm. with filmmaking. Um, and so you always, I mean, for my film, I made the decision that this is going to be in one location. And that's okay. just a hard line in the sand. Because I believe you can tell a good story in one location. You know, it's just your ego that tells you, oh, no, but I want to have five locations and I want to show people the beach and the freeway and the exteriors and um, because the audience doesn't really care. They just want to be engaged. So mm -hmm. part of that art is engaging people with what you got. And if you don't got the resources to shoot for eight days and you have permits to shoot in five different places, then, you know, let's just do this in one location. And then you get into another challenge is that stories are more effective when they're in one continuum. So what that means is no flashbacks and no flash forwards. There's no five days later. Tell it all from almost in real time. And that's a lot harder than you think it is when you're writing, because you're like, oh my God, I can't just leave the scene. We have to keep going. Yeah. And so what that does is it forces you to be more honest. What would really happen? What's go supposed to happen, honestly? And then when you get to that answer, you're like, okay, well now that I know we're about this, I kind of have to throw away everything I've written so far because now I learned what this is really about. So it's that process of digging deep down to the nucleus of an idea and then building mm -hmm. outwards again. It's kind of a chaos and creation that um, 
it never gets easier, but you get better at it. So um, that's kind of the, the what I, when you're working with low resources, that's kind of uh, what it what the challenge really is. It's like, okay, well, we have a living room. What what makes this story good in a living room? Like, what, why is a living room better than uh, a shopping mall or a, a classroom? And then you write from there. And it's not ideal when you want to be creative, but actually putting your creativity in a box makes you more creative. And uh, that's the art of it. And, and it's, it's very thrilling when you, when you feel like, okay, now this story couldn't be any other way. Mm-hmm. It has to be like this now. And so um, it's really exciting. It's, it, but it's daunting when you start. When you're like, okay, well, I'm going to shoot a short film. Well, where do I start? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's hard. And then you get that idea and you have to make it. So. Yeah, cool, cool. Well, let's put a pin in that short film thing. So I do want to talk about one of your short films, but the main reason why you're here today is you want we are here to talk about Beverly Hills Exorcist, and 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 you touched on some of the things that you inspired you as far as a filmmaker, and and and, and you do all three. You're you're a filmmaker, you're a producer, and you're a writer. So in those roles. And especially with this film, what inspired you to create Beverly Hills Exorcist? Um, well, there is uh, my biggest inspiration tonally and creatively for Beverly Hills Exorcist is there is a Japanese anime written by um, this mangaka, this writer called One, as in the number one. Mm-hmm. And um, it off, it's like a very modern, satirical and heartfelt take on freelance exorcism if you can believe it and it's just one of the greatest animes i think of the last 20 years and i think he's one of the greatest writers of the century honestly i think the only person that comes close to him is mark millar who does the kingsman series and he does a lot of great graphic novels um and so mob psycho 100 like a lot of other animes draws from the wuxia genre which is like this chinese uh uh, folklore, storytelling about chivalrous martial artists, and that is in a lot of animes, that influence. But in Mob Psycho 100, it's kind of manifest as people use kung fu almost to fight, kung fu with power to fight the, the ghosts, right? And so that's something that really moved me as well, and that's what inspired me to do a story about these freelance exorcists in a modern, modern setting, and they use, everyone has kind of different abilities, and they kind of clash with the ghost, and then, um, and normally with filmmaking and films, when you do a, like a monster story or a ghost story, especially on a low budget, usually the way it works is there's a slow burn in the beginning and they reveal the monster at the end and the monster looks really cool and they defeat it or don't defeat it and that's the end. I wanted to do a story like, what if the monster's there the whole time and everyone's fighting it the whole time? And so that actually harkens to like the anime. There's a lot of animes that are like that. Um, and so I was really inspired by it, especially when people reveal their different powers and the fights take twists and turns and people mm-hmm. power up. And I liked that kind of take on fighting a supernatural entity. And so um, my challenge was taking that and Americanizing it um, and to put a fresh spin on things without copying things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I feel like, we'll see, well, the audience can judge how it came out. Okay, cool, cool. Well, I, I, well, as someone who says thank you for sending me a, a advanced screening of the film, and I, I don't want to spoil anything for our, our listeners and, and your potential viewers, but I will say that uh, you, what what you can what you were able to put on the screen, and as you dark, just articulated, that came through through and through especially for me as someone who i'm really not a big fan of the horror genre so uh but i really but i I was from it was a very short film but i was entertained from from start to finish and i I liked the various uh, characters that you had in the film uh in particular as far as you you, as you know you had the guy in the chair you had some of the um you had you, you had you had a little element of of romance and, and tension between some of the characters and you know all you know it, it, even though it was a short film you, you really touched on a lot of things in in, in the in the in the time that you uh had the story progressing on the screen so that being with talking about the cast and stuff what was your 
how did you go about developing your cast? I, I was looking at the uh, credits, and I, I, I noticed you, 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 uh, you're sort of becoming like James Gunn. You have some, some of your go-to folks in your in your project. Uh, so tell me, tell me, how did you uh, come across with this uh, with with, the, with this cast? Well, um, I was very. Thank you so much for your kind words on the film. First of all, thank you so much. It means a lot to me that um, you would watch a short film uh, and uh, really have that feedback for it. I was driven to like uh, make something that would always arouse your curiosity at every step of the way until you get to the end. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's the ending? And yeah. that to me is when a film really works. Uh, but as far as the cast goes, um, I, when I was working as an editor, um, I got a call from an actor I'd worked with on a project. And that actor was Greg Morton, who's, also, who's in my film. And he w uh, needed help making, um, this is right when influencers were making their first comedy sketches and going really viral. This was like 2017. And he was trying to make a step into that scene, but he needed help making a sketch. So he knew I edited and he asked me, you can you help me make a sketch? And so we worked together on a few sketches and they went viral with other influencers that were way bigger than anybody. I mean, they were the biggest people in the world were watching the sketches that we just kind of made. And so he, Greg Martin became so popular and worked with all the biggest people and I got sucked into it too, kind of. Like people were calling me, I'm like, why are you calling me? I'm nobody. Um, but, it, but working with those influencers was really interesting and I really got a chance to meet a lot of great people who weren't just influencers but they were great actors mm -hmm. and what drove me to make an ensemble film was I wanted to use all these people and let them shine in a film and I thought uh, if I can make a story where everyone can contribute a little something it will give the story a lot of variety and uh, especially if I'm gonna do something that's low budget in one location, that's a great way to have a lot of variety for the audience. Um, and so we, because of the sketches we had done, we got an offer to do some theatrical style sketches for a company called iFunny. And we did a little bit more fancy theatrical style sketches with a union film crew and sound department and, okay. and uh, and th those were great, and that's when I had my first opportunity to work with Greg Martin and Amanda McCants and Ryan Kendrick, who are in my film. I had a chance to work with them in like a theatrical setting, and they are just so amazing. And so when it came time to to do uh, Beverly Hills Exorcist, I I said I'm not taking any chances. We got to call the best people, and so um, it, it's a privilege to to work with great actors like that, honestly, because. Um, one of the challenges when you're doing a, a film is, is is finding the right people for the role. And mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems with short films and indie films is frequently people are not are miscast. And it's just because they can't find the right people or whatever. So I was very lucky to work with incredible people. I mean, that's I'll, I'll go to the grave happy about that. Yeah, yeah. I will say the, 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 the casting really was on point as far as uh, the... the, the roles that people were planning i guess was greg was was he the guy in the chair <laughs> <laughs> greg uh uh, he the, uh the chair the... um greg martin uh he's the curly headed guy the curly headed guy yeah yeah okay yeah so okay. yeah 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 he uh yeah it was i i really liked uh oh yeah the he... chair you're right you're right i i I had a mindset, yeah. but yeah he's sitting in a chair in the beginning i'm like the chair the chair that yeah yeah so yeah he's using, I, I, he's I used that the machinery to yeah, he's a colloquial guy. It's like uh, any, any of our fans who uh, and listeners who, who who we joke about the guy in the chair, you know, with um, and, and the old Arrowverse shows on the Flash. He always had uh, Cisco Ramon, you know, sort of the guy, the, <laughs> the guy who was in the chair, or or uh, I think even in the Spider-Man movies now recently, I guess Ned played that role for for uh, Tom Holland's Peter. So <laughs> he joked about that kind of thing. But um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I really. Yeah, yeah, and she was really good. I, I really liked her. Uh, and speaking of what transitioned to her, and I know there was uh, there's some history between uh, Sonia and Sebastian in, in the film that was really, and I, if you get, uh, without giving, too, I don't want to give any, anything away, but 
uh, you know, whenever we were introduced to these characters, there was definitely, you, you could tell there was something there. And it, you wouldn't care to elaborate on that uh, or, do you, or, or something that'll uh, give too much oh, away. Oh, no, of course. Uh, yeah. Well, I, well uh, if you really want to see what really, how it unfolds, you know, Geek Fest tickets are on sale now. But uh, actually, uh, thank you for asking. The, the leads of these characters, the lead of this story are these two central characters, Sonia and Sebastian. Sonia is the lead in this story. And um, I don't want to give away too much, but I can say that uh, I wanted the whole film to have the feeling of a final battle. Mm -hmm. And so that included um, ratcheting up the stakes of the interpersonal dynamics with the lead characters, and I wanted the film to happen, to land. We enter the story right as their complex history of unresolved tension reaches a boiling point with each other, right before they 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 take on a, a demon, the most powerful demon on the west side of Los Angeles. And so, intertwining those conflicts, the the interpersonal conflicts with the, with the two leads, with the demon was really kind of what the story is really about. That's what makes, what gives the movie its heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, um, and that's what gives Sonya her, her arc in the story. Um, and so I'm really excited for, for audiences to go on that journey with such great actors. Yeah. Also seamlessly blending in just a lot of special effects while it's happening. And what I'm proud of is that all of those things kind of congeal and you're not thinking okay that's special effects and that that cgi you're just watching the story yeah. and um and it's really a, a credit to the actors who could pull it off yeah. it's not easy working with special effects and, yeah um, yeah because i would imagine because i would imagine th 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 whenever you know, that all those vfx were done post i mean they weren't done yes. so so t tell me of the challenges as you for you as a director having to direct actors who may may or may not be familiar working with uh vfx especially uh work because I, I really you know, i don't know if there was really other than a, a couple pieces in there i didn't see many things that were practical effect but there were a lot of you know more visual uh special effects that were that were going on there so how how what's the what's the challenge for you as a director and in, in helping those actors who may not may or may not be familiar with doing that type of work well um it's hard for actors to work with visual effects um and, it, and what i found is it really depends on if the actors themselves, we're at a point now where a lot of actors have grown up watching special effects movies and they kind of know how they're done a little bit. So if you're lucky enough to work with an actor like that, you're golden because they know, they, they know, okay, this is supposed to happen and they bring to it their knowledge of how these movies turn out. And I have to give credit to Amanda McCants. She's exactly that kind of person. I don't know what her taste in movies is. I don't know what she watches, but I could tell working with her. Okay, she gets it. She gets it. Yeah what yeah, is going I got that. on here and how it's supposed to come out and um and as, as a filmmaker um i believe visual effects are like an extension of directing so mm -hmm. there is a class system in the movie business that says okay well directors are over here special effects artists are over there writers are here but i see it as you know your job as a director is to get the shot and to create that shot that you need to tell the story. That's what you're a director, that's what you do. And so visual effects is just going a step further. You're just creating that shot using trickery and you're still putting all that skill, like what do we need really for the story? Mm. And coincidentally, we had we just had Godzilla minus one, ah. uh, where the director was also the visual effects supervisor and led a small team. Mm. So that's a very purist approach because um, you know movies are special effects. I mean, movies were pioneered by magicians like uh, Georges Méliès, right? Mm. Uh, the the Earth to the Moon, the Moonshot yeah. movie. Yeah. I mean, he was a magician, and uh, movies illusions are inherent to movies. So mm. I think getting into that trickery is just a purist extension of filmmaking. So I was really excited to work to create these shots and to do really give the audience something everything i had give them something that they won't forget let's give them a treat for their eyes 
and um, uh, yeah. Well, I'll have to say, but special effects, special effects without a story, are yeah. really boring. So that's why I um, really wanted people to go on an emotional journey with this movie, yeah. and uh, and really work on a story that I felt was original and special, but at the same time needed special effects to happen, and yeah. so. You're like a hammer looking for a nail, but also it has to be organic and it has to be right. I yeah, don't know if yeah. that makes sense. No, I, that makes total sense. And and I will say, uh, given that this was is a short film, I was very impressed uh, with uh, with the special effects and VFX work that was that was done. Uh, did you? How, how, did you? Who who did those? I mean, I saw the credits, but how did you go about finding someone who could bring your vision? In, into life, uh, in particular, uh, with 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 the, with the demon in particular that, uh, that that has to be exercised from the house. Oh well, um, I did most of the special effects myself. Oh, I uh, my favorite TV show when I was a kid was this show on Discovery Channel called Movie Magic, and uh, they would oh, yeah. explain. Do you know Movie Magic? Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, <laughs> I watched. I've watched exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, I've watched I've watched a few episodes for sure. Yeah, yeah. And so I that informed me. And when I was doing like industrial editing work, I would do a lot of sophisticated tricks, not just to save movies. Like we're missing a shot and insert of them grabbing the gun. So you actually create that with special effects. You would like green screen the background, recreate the set, and get rent a prop and have a stand in do the. Cre- you just fabricate that shot with special effects, and the audience doesn't know they. I yeah, just saw a special effect. Mm. And so that gave me a lot of practice, how to do a really good green screen, how to integrate these things properly, how to recreate the background and how important it is. And yeah. so um, I did, for the demon, um, I was really inspired by um, uh, a lot of uh, anime kind of influences, as in sp- specifically um, from Spirited Away. Okay. There's Yubaba who's just this really monstrous face of a character. And there's something very disturbing about a large oversized head that fills half the room. And also the Borg Queen from Star Trek uh-huh. First Contact. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that's all that. Yeah. The when, especially that first scene where the Borg Queen is lowered from uh, mm-hmm. all this machinery hanging from these cables and it's just this pale head. I mean, that's an unforgettable shot. That's got to be one of the top visual effect shots in the history of movies. Um, And so for me, that really informed this design of the demon. Um, But I did it mostly myself. There were three shots I needed help with, and I worked with um, this this guy, uh, this gentleman, very, very talented man, uh, Timothy Teamer. And he just did it no problem. And he's like, you know, if you had done some facial scans, this would go a lot smoother. I'm like, okay, yes, yes. (laughs) <laughs> and boom, he did these three shots like no problem. And then I looked up his credits afterwards. I hadn't even looked. He's like worked on Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay. He's worked on uh, Raised by Wolves. I mean, he's worked on these massive special effects wow. shows. I'm like, oh yeah. my God. Yeah. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, it. Um, I really take, take a holistic approach to it. Um, I like just having total control of the frame yeah. and really having every shot have a meaning and purpose and intention and creating this feeling to the audience that first of all, they're in good hands. And second of all, never pause for the effect. Mm-hmm. Like I think a, a mistake a lot of amateurs make, especially me when I was an amateur is if you're going to do a hard shot, the whole movie stops for your hard shot. Like look at the shot. It was so hard. And, you don't want to do that. What matters is what's happening in the story, not the special effects. So if the special effects is really hard, but the story dictates that this is supposed to happen quickly, there you go. That was six weeks of work, and it happened in two seconds, and we got to keep the story moving. Um, so yeah. So hopefully, I think when people watch the film, I hope no one thinks, oh, that shot looked hard, or that shot looked impressive. I would just want people to think, like, wow, I would... I would really like to see uh, where this uh, freelance exorcist, uh, this squad, where do they go next? That's what I want to see. Yeah, and if yeah. people feel that, uh, 
I feel that uh, all the illusioneering and all the engineering behind visual effects was worth it. Because again, if you don't have a story, it's really a boring thing. It's really yeah. not worth doing if you don't have a great story. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I, know, I noticed you meant, speaking to that point. I know you mentioned Ghostbusters was a, a, a inspiration for you in, in, in making this film, and I and I will say for uh, for uh, viewers when you when you do watch it, and, and one of the things that, the first thing that I, as I was watching the watching the film was, oh yeah, I, I'm I'm definitely getting that Ghostbuster vibe. But but you're right. Uh, but at the as the story progressed, I mean, again in a very short amount of time. You did a very good job of making me as a viewer invested in these characters, uh, which is no small feat. Oh, I mean, you. we could, you know, we joke all the time on podcasts, like with um, you know, we were just discussing Three Body Problem, for example, on uh, it was just on Netflix, and there was one particular character on there that I was having a hard time getting invested in because the way that the character was written, you know. I went further down in the show, things happened, but, you know, it was so late in the story that I was sort of like, eh. you know, whenever the big thing happened for that character, I was like, okay. <laughs> but, oh, you know, that's but, the worst. Yeah, but, but I, I will say, yeah, I will say all, you know, you, you know so very, uh, I think there were, what, four or five people in your cast, and all, all of them were, you know, this team, I could see that they, there was, uh, what came about for me was there was a history there with these with these characters good and bad and and oh, and there and 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 when the film ended i, I was like okay when's, when's the sequel coming <laughs> so oh. oh thank you so much that's uh that's because, really yeah, I, here thank you yeah it, it was it was it was a really really good very cohesive uh part of make, you know, make, uh, made film uh, and piece of filmmaking so I, I will say that I definitely got that about and and I can see the Ghostbusters influence in there so <laughs> and had you know oh, a little bit of elements of comedy and um, you know the scary moments and that kind of thing so oh thank you it means a lot to hear that that's exactly I think what I would define as success for the film is that to, to people to take away that impression and of course everybody takes away something different from a film mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which is one another beauty of an ensemble cast because you have s someone different people for different people to connect with like um, Speaking a little bit about Ghostbusters actually one of the things that I really liked about Ghostbusters is The technology in Ghostbusters mm -hmm. you have the proton packs and the containment unit and the trap and it all looks so real and it sounds so powerful yeah. and and the thing is you could take out all that technology and you could still kind of do Ghostbusters. It would just, they could use magic, or they could use Kung Fu, or they could use other things to catch the ghost. But when you introduce all the technology and science fiction to it, you add another layer of believability and groundedness and excitement, and you bring in people who are interested in technology. And there are a lot of people that want to see that. Like another movie, right, that really influenced me was Back to the Future. And that's another story. You can do without the DeLorean and without the Doctor. You could have Marty hit his head and wake up you know, 30 years in the past, because what that story is really about is him meeting his parents when they're his own age as teenagers. So yeah. that's the heart of the movie. Yeah. But you introduce the technology, and you introduce the 88 miles per hour, and you introduce this techno thriller element. Now you're opening up the story to people who are, you know, their imagination is 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 it opens up to these things, and you bring more people in. And that's certainly for me, like, in the, there's a scene in my film where Greg Martin, the scientist character, turns a machine on all the way to maximum power. And for me, I was thinking, okay, 88 miles per hour. Yeah. We're doing 88 miles per hour. Yeah. Um, <laughs> crossing the streams. <laughs> because, <laughs> well, 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 I went through my head. It was crossing the streams. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> because, like, with technology, what's exciting about it is technology is so powerful, but it's only as reliable as the people who are using it. Mm -hmm. And so if people are like, not don't know what they're doing, or if they are intimidated, you know, maybe they'll misuse it. And that adds to the excitement of it. Yeah. And for me, definitely. Um, I, I, I learned that also props are expensive. If you want like a big... Yeah prop or an actor can operate it you're going to spend a lot of money yeah. <laughs> and you have to think well 
go ahead. Yeah, to that point, I mean, yeah. So, so we were talking. I know we were talking about effects and props and other things. So how do you how did you nav- deal with that as far as this you know, budgeting and also do you foresee in the f- first question and the second question is do you foresee yourself working doing more practical effect than than the traditional you know as far as traditional models and, and things like that and and, and in the future and then uh and then i'll and i'll have another question about just the props and how you came about them here in a second yeah um well uh oh yeah i love practical effects and i would love to do practical effects in fact the demon in the film was practical in the sense that the mm-hmm. face was this incredible makeup work by cynthia uh, garza of, oh, really? of alterian studios and so uh. she has worked on in her studio worked on some of the biggest shows like Chucky and the new Hocus Pocus and yeah. uh, they do like the best stuff and so she created the face and so everyone is looking at the demon's face in the film uh, and but at, but the demon has this torture apparatus that's all computer generated that, that mm-hmm. it's wearing and also probably 99% of the time the background the house and everything is computer generated Huh. And most people don't even notice because they're looking at the demon. Exactly. Um, and that's a classic. That's a classic. Mis- so the thing people are really looking at, you want to do that practical always. And then if you hiding the magic, you can use CGI, and it usually works really well. Yeah. But if you CGI the thing everyone's looking at, uh, it's a lot harder to pull it off. Yeah. Um, but I love just magic tricks. It doesn't matter the how you do it with a computer or with a model or you building a set and painting flats. I just like using tricks to to make something to astonish people, and um, and I would love to do more of that in uh, in the future. Um, and I'm writing. Uh, there's a feature film version of this film that I'm writing, okay. and I would really very much love to make that. And I'm also writing uh, other stories. And the common thing is that they all um, have a through line where the fantastic meets the personal. Mm-hmm. And always to make that, you're going to need to use some kind of trickery to to create those pictures that can tell those stories. So for me, I'm open to any and all ways of creating those pictures, so long as the heart is there. Yeah, yeah, and that's 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 a very good point because you know I remember uh, I think Brett Spiner years ago I was watching an interview with him from Place Data from Star Trek: Next Generation for folks who may not be familiar with that. But uh, he 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 said it best. Uh, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. And, uh, and oh, that's a beautiful way of saying it. Um, and you know, and again, a very uh, like again, a very effects a heavy franchise that that Star Trek is. But you know, the stories that stand out, it's the story at the end of the day. Uh, and uh, and I really appreciate hearing. Your approach to to storytelling and, and filmmaking in that in that as well definitely sounds like you, you have that same philosophy that um, you know, the effects can only take you so far. You've got to have that. You got to have that story to keep the audience engaged, which takes, I guess, projects from A to you know from a C level project to an A level project as far as for for the viewing experience. Well, speaking to the nuts and bolts of filmmaking, I mean, it, the screenwriter is the only original artist on a film mm-hmm. every other position is interpretive they're interpreting the script so it all comes down to it and so it was thanks to that to my script that um when i would show people when i was trying to make it i got a lot of just immediate yeah let's do it and i was kind of surprised and then uh someone had shared actually someone who i had worked with mary c russell who was a great filmmaker herself she shared the script with eileen Dietz, who's uh, famously portrayed um, the face of the demon in the mm-hmm. original 1973 Exorcist, and mm-hmm. so then Eileen Dietz started calling me just un- just out of nowhere, blowing up my phone, and she said, "I have to be in this movie. I have to play awesome. the demon. You don't understand. I have to. I am this demon." <laughs> and I thought, is, is 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 like a Hollywood person really calling me to be in my movie? Yeah. What, what happened? It, it, but you know, that's the magic of of a script that. I mean, forget about being a great script. Just a script that is honest and tells a story honestly and mm-hmm. ends where it's supposed to end with a real ending, right? Yeah. It doesn't have to be like a work of genius. Just be honest the whole time and end with a real ending that really says to the audience, this is what life is like, and I really believe this. Yeah. That's a real script. 
Yeah. And if you can pull that off, you'll be surprised, I think, what happens when you show people that are related to the entertainment business, people who know what real scripts look like. I mean, people mm-hmm. say all the time, oh, yeah, if you write a script, um, no one cares, no one wants to read it. There are people dying to read good scripts out there who are dying to be in good projects out there. So mm-hmm. you just have to come up with that script. Yeah. How? Speaking of which, how... And, 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 and to that point, being that you were both the screenwriter and a director, uh, how, and, and, and as you noted, the screenwriter really is the, the, the probably the original piece. But then you're you're also directing your work. How, what what was sort of the thing? What was the method that you used to help? Uh, sort of, not you know. Clearly, you're very close to it. So, who who is your like? guardrail or your reality check to say rim um this you know this this in the script is is working it is it, saying one way but as you're trying to direct it it's just not not working or or, or vice versa uh the way that you know so how did how did how did you go about that being that you wore both hats and, and just sort of making well, making this thing work well the hard part is like um one of the hard parts is when you're making a film is just to make sure everyone is making the same movie with you. Uh, so United people have to like be on board with it. Mm. But I think when you spend a lot of time with the script, um, as I did, um, <clears throat> you, it, you like, it kind of goes into your subconscious. Like when you spend a lot of time on something, and you can't solve a problem, for example, then out of nowhere you just come up with the solution or you come up with an idea that works, right? And you think that idea came to you for free, but it didn't because you had been working on it for so long and your subconscious mind was working on it. And your subconscious mind is the real genius because like your conscious mind, you want to be liked. You want everyone to smile at you and tell you you're great. But your subconscious mind doesn't care. Your subconscious mind is this dinosaur beast of 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 a thing that just is raw creation. And so harnessing that is really uh, what you, the benefit of working a long time on a project and letting the, not getting in the way of that. In fact, I think a lot of writing a script is just getting out of the way of, your, of yourself mm-hmm. and that putting away that side of you that wants to be liked and wants uh, a lot of material things that are not really good for telling an honest story. Um, and when it comes to shooting with actors, I just, um, I want them to be honest. And if for them being honest means changing it in a way that they can do it best, I'm fine with that. What I just want is everyone to give their best work. And if their best work is a little different than what I would have wanted, we'll adjust the movie to match your best work. And I think if a movie is made of people's best work, there's something so special there. And it's much more special than what my ego would say, oh, it has to be like this. I mean, that's, uh, that's never as good as if you can bring out the best in people and um and i think bringing out the best in people starts with you putting your best in first i mean people have antenna they know when the writer and the director is really doing his best and he's trying to make something special and people kind of lock into that and they whether they like it or not it brings out the best in them and that's the hard part that's really hard because you can't fake it right and i think um or at least i can't i cannot i've heard of people that are maybe better at that kind of faking thing but i can't I, I have to really do it and i was lucky that people locked into what i was trying to do and brought their best to it and I, it's it's a privilege to work with such talented people especially i think you know working in, in in like los angeles you know because of tax incentives and things like that uh, productions go where they can receive incentives from governments to shoot right so that means shooting in the United, the UK or in Canada or sometimes in Prague or wherever. Um, and it's not easy or cheap to shoot in Los Angeles if you're an industrial production, if you're gonna, if you're a big production because of the of the tax breaks that you can get elsewhere. But if you shoot in LA, there are so many people in Los Angeles who've learned from apprenticeship, from apprenticeship, crafts in filmmaking techniques that go back to the silent era. Mm. And you have that lineage of talent with you there on set in Los Angeles. For example, uh, Cynthia Garza and, and, uh, and uh, her partner Sven, Sven Granlund um, were apprentices. They are these special effects makeup artists and they were apprentices um, of Dick Smith 
Okay. And Dick Smith was a very famous, uh, a very notable Hollywood visual effects makeup artist who worked, who pioneered the visual effects for the original 1973 Exorcist. Mm -hmm. Like, what a coincidence that I'm working yeah. with his students on my film, which is something you'd never get if you went to... I mean, you'd never get it organically. You'd have to right. hire them and then fly them out somewhere else. Um, so, but just, it was a happy accident for me. It was just like, oh, That's there's right. somebody who does who does monsters. You should you should talk to them. And lo and behold. So, like, I think, you know, the magic of that is doing your best work. And then people want to help you. People want to help someone who's really pushing themselves. Mm -hmm. So, it just sends out a signal. And other artists, especially kind of find it a little they find sympathy to it and they want to learn a little more and maybe they want to help with it too and so it's it's very like i said uh it's a, it's a privilege it's a privilege well, to be involved with people like that. that that that's so that's so awesome that you're that, that your beverly hills exorcist has ties it has you know, one or two degrees of separation to be to be to the the old classic film, and of course I know they're I think they're uh, doing another another reboot of it uh, here here it, it, here recently. But uh, speaking of speaking of the California and that and that in Los Angeles and that and that great greater Los Angeles area, what inspired you to pick Beverly Hills as the place to to be where this uh, demon is uh, holed up in this house? Well, that's a great question, actually. Um, I strongly, with Beverly Hills, I strongly believe that um, there's no such thing as a portable story. Mm -hmm. So um, the best narratives are linked to the setting. And so the setting shapes the characters, and it shapes uh, the story, right? Like, you know... Like take divorce for example, people divorce in California differently than they would divorce in Louisiana, right? Uh, so the the setting shapes it, and so for me the like the nucleus of this story, what really made me write it and informed everything about the writing and the adventure of it was what if a house, what if a house is too expensive to be haunted? Mm -hmm. So that means that the buyer or the owner has can not only afford the astronomical price of the house, but they can afford to pay top dollar for uh, a freelance supernatural fixer to cleanse the house of demons and risk their own life and limb to do it. Hmm. And so where would that be possible? So for me, Beverly Hills was the right place to set a story yeah. like that. Yeah. And so in setting it, uh, in Beverly Hills, you can also explore some social satire mm -hmm. of like privilege and wealth versus kind of the more uh, ghost hunters who are kind of not a part of that, but they intersect with it. Um, but in a short film, there wasn't a lot of time to deep dive that theme. But in the feature yeah. film, I do. So um, uh, film financiers, uh, you, you're welcome to talk to me about it. Uh, there's a really great script here for a feature film. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, I wish you all the best uh, with with getting this developed into a into a feature length project. I think there's a there's a, a lot of things in the, and when, when uh, folks are able to, to watch this film, uh, there there are a lot of threads that you could definitely with with more time and uh, more resources can really explore uh, and, and just as especially like what you what you just shared here because uh, you know for folks like me, I live in North Carolina, but you know, one of the things you do hear about it, it, it is is the the uh, cost of things, and you know everywhere. Uh, and and uh, and that was um, I, I, not again as I was watching the film. Uh, you, you, I do get the I did get the hint of some of the social socioeconomic and uh, class things that you, that you were that you were dealing with, and even I think even going back to the original Ghostbusters, they even had that some of those elements in there too. Of course, when we think about the big wedding scene uh, where Slimer is oh, yeah. in the big, yeah. big, big ballroom. <laughs> you know, so, uh, and, and then of course, uh, the hotel manager didn't want to pay for it. But anyway, I won't, this is not a ghost, <laughs> this, this is not a Ghostbusters review pod today, but uh, I know I put a pin at a project that you worked on in the time, in the time we have remaining here. Uh, in addition to uh, Beverly Hills Exorcist, there was another short project that you, that you've done recently called, um, 
uh, let's be kids. And uh, that, uh, tell me, tell, tell I'll, I'll let you uh, share uh, what that project is about. Uh, I know for me, I was I was laughing out loud. It's a very short piece, but uh, there, there, there was uh, I, I found it very, very funny and uh, wanted to. Def- I definitely made a note to talk to you about it today. Oh, well, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I, uh, I really like that sketch too. Thank you so much for the kind words about it. Um, uh, that's a sketch that is kind of this, you know, social s- satire, you know, farcical sketch where these grown me- grown men, these grown adults, um, have like this business-like boardroom meeting, but the the errand of the day is to discuss. Um, whether or not they should like girls and so this you finally realize that this these are actually little kids and they're debating whether or not they should take that leap into associating with girls and um that sketch really depends to be to work really depends on the actors and they have to get like what that is and what 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 to go for and so I was so lucky to work th- with like such great people on that. Um, there was like Christopher Kai, who is a great actor, and he's um, you, he he was on Animal Kingdom, and he's in okay. the Social Network, and and uh, of course Greg Martin and yep. uh, Amanda McCants, who yep. would right after lead my short film, and also um, uh, this incredible uh, Tiffany Toth who is uh, famously a Playboy playmate and also just a real multi-talented person. And she, an amazing artist, photographer, sculptor, photo photo artist. She just does does it all. And yeah. so she was nice enough to come in and do it. And, um, and, uh, and it was always kind of my dream to work with like an incredible ensemble like that and do something funny and impactful. Um, and uh, we only had about an hour and a half to shoot it, so oh, wow. I like made made my little shot list and and when we shot it, um, there was like some problems. People kind of didn't get it, mm-hmm. and I was told like, okay, well, good luck with that one. But then <laughs> when we when I when I delivered it, um, the reception was really positive and iFunny, the company that we had done it for, offered me like a spin-off series for it, and they told me what about a classroom and what about like all this mm-hmm. stuff. And I said, I don't, I'm gonna make my short film. I don't know if I can keep this up, but uh, thank yeah. you so much for, for, for calling that out. Uh, I'm glad it made an impression on you. Yeah, yeah, it it, it did. It was, uh, you know, I thought about big, you know, so it's one of the, especially when you have these grown people and it's sort of like the e-trade ads you know where you have the babies talking like with the business it's sort of like the inverse of that (laughs) Uh, with that that vibe where you know you have the babies talking about the stock market but here you have grown people in this in this classroom setting and they're and and it just brings back uh all the awkwardness of uh you know of the early years and 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 sort of coming of age and i think so uh, but it was just kind of. It, it, it took me. It took me a minute to, to be honest. Whenever first when I was watching it, I was like, and then when it, when it clicked, I was like, oh yeah, this is this is this. I did I uh, that and and uh, one of the little through lines that uh, uh, all little boys get picked on about doing, and I won't spoil it for for, for view uh, <laughs> prospective watchers. But uh, I, I was like, yeah, that 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 works. That works. So. Yeah. Um, well, again, uh, thank you so much for your time. Again, tell folks um, where uh, I know it's going to be debuting at the Geek Film Fest. Um, in addition to to that, uh, is it going to be? Are you going to have the Beverly Hills Exorcist uh, distributed elsewhere after after its uh, debut? Um, well, we are showing at Geek Fest, and Geek Fest will be traveling Comic Cons uh, across the country this year. Um, but also, um, we are selected for um, the Grossman Fantastic Film and Wine Festival, okay. which by Movie Maker Magazine was rated a top 25 coolest film hmm. festival in the world. And uh, they pick, they curate only a sh- small amount of short films and, um, and only a very small amount of films from the United States. Okay. So it's really, really humbling and cool that they would pick... Uh, our awesome. little film and so um maybe i'll i'll go to that 
And we are ho very hopeful we'll be in a few more notable festivals this year. Time will tell. Uh, but uh, definitely thank you so much for yeah, sharing so, your platform. Yeah, so after, before we go, uh, after, so you'll have the film festival circuit. Uh, after the film festival circuit, do you plan on uh, releasing it on, say, YouTube or, or 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 where can people who who may not be able to uh, view it at you know who are fortunate enough to be able to have a film festival in their backyard or, or, or want to watch it online or you know or where 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 will be able to, we'll, we'll be able to find it? Um, well, hopefully, um, I'm talking to a couple of distributors, uh, but um, I cannot do those deals yet because most film festivals will qualify a short film if you have a distribution deal in Got place. Or, okay. um, so time will tell. I'm very hopeful to do to partner with the distributor. Um, like, again, I've already talked to a number of them, and I'm really humbled and, and honestly really grateful that, there, that there's a response. Any, I mean, short films don't make money. They're not really business things. They're like a showcase yeah. pieces. So if anyone yeah. wants to say, hey, I'm willing to put a little bit of money here to distribute this, that is just an incredible honor for the production. Cool. And I don't even ca care about the money about for a short film because they don't make money, but just that someone would invest in it is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I know you, and I know you mentioned earlier that uh, you're hoping to expand this to a, a feature length film so hopefully uh you know whenever uh it's being shown at some of these film festivals somebody will say yes yeah, so i want to green like this and help you expand it to feature length because it is it is a very fun and unique story and uh one that uh as as i, as I noted earlier uh, there's some definite threads there that if uh, you have more more time and resources uh you, you have the, the makings of a, a very very special feature film there and um and i thank you for for coming on here today to, to, to talk with me about uh, your film Beverly Hills Exorcist. Uh, before we go, tell people where they can find you uh, on socials and um, and your website and, and other pieces of contact info. Um, all you need to know is my name, Rem Scobel, R-E-M-S-E-O-B-E-L-L, Twitter, X, I'm sorry, X, Instagram, yeah, I do all that. Yeah. you name it, Google, hit up Rem Scobel, you'll find everything and if you like that sketch let's be kids it's on my website rimscobble.com and um follow me on instagram that's the place i promote the latest happenings and uh i'm very hopeful to have some good news in the very very near future awesome awesome well thank you so much again for for joining us today uh you can uh Again, if you're in North Hollywood, go to the Geek Film Fest uh, next this, next weekend. Correct? I know we're recording today on May 11th, but uh, the uh, your film will be debuting on May Sunday, May 19th at May 19th. 6 p.m. Great. So be sure to check that out. I'll drop a link in the uh, show notes here, so that if you want to buy tickets to the Geek Film Fest, you will be able to do so. And with that, thank you so much, Rem, for, for joining us here on Cena Nerd Presents the Interviews. Uh, again, my name is Will Polk. You can always visit our website at www.cenanerdpodcast.com to get us wherever you get your podcast. And with that, take care, nerds. Good night. Geek out. You're welcome.